<laughs> when I read what they were writing, I thought this is not, I mean, I, as you see me respond, this is not news. Everyone has seen on air uh, the disagreements. Sometimes right. they get very heated even. And that is for everybody to witness. This is not news that there are some people that do not agree with my opinions. And sometimes very passionately, they don't agree with my right. opinions. So I just felt like this is like a funny thing to eat. For one, is this news? I know right. It's, not really well, it's news. news it's news to the Daily Beast. It's news to the mainstream media because they don't do this any what our show does, which is bring like you and I disagree on plenty of things on some of those subjects. Ryan and, and you disagree even more strongly and Brianna like we have a we have a range of views on these important subjects and we actually discuss them and debate them and sometimes it gets heated. I don't think it gets heated very often, but it, of course it does sometimes. And that, right. like, that's what our show is about, is having actual debates and disagreement. And no one else in the media does that anymore. They used to do that. You used to bring on, the host would bring on people they disagreed with. They would have panel segments where there's debate. But now everyone, CNN, MSNBC, Fox too, there's no actual disagreement. You're brought on to agree with the host, and that's it. So what our show does, it didn't used to be this way, but is now, I, I think, totally unique in all the media. So it is news to the Daily Beast that, oh my God, can you believe that? <laughs> They're going off script. They're actually having like like uncomfortable moments where people are, are right. upset with each other and disagreeing and quarreling. But like that's what the viewer the viewers don't just want to be told things they already know by people who's like you could you could write their talking points for them because you already know what they're gonna say. So right. anyway, that's why I think they think it's news, even though it's not news to us and it's not news to our viewers. Yeah, this wasn't news at all. It's definitely not news to the viewers. Everybody has seen, you know, the, the disagreements on air. This is not news at all. One thing, though, I want to mention. So they kind of when they when they wrote this piece, they mentioned that I was uh, that I had been deep that I had been um, blocked on YouTube and then suspended on YouTube and that the Hill had been also suspended at one point, almost like pinning it on me. For one, my suspension from YouTube for the covid misinformation, quote unquote, was reversed not even with me appealing it. YouTube reversed it on their own volition and issued me an apology. So of right. course they don't write that in the piece. Right. Secondly, I had nothing to do with when the Hill was suspended. That was you and, and, and Ryan and Emily Jashinsky when you guys were talking. I wasn't even in that segment at all, but they still kind of made it sound like, uh, oh, you know, people at the Hill are worried that Kim's going to get the, the platform in trouble. I think we all of course, worry about that. That's also not a secret. We always are mentioning and joking about, oh no, you know, the, the YouTube censors coming after us. But look, you know, every organization has, you know, and we've seen this in the news. We see it at Netflix. We see it at Spotify. We're seeing it now at Twitter. There's always that person or small group of people. Uh, sometimes it's a larger group, depending on the organization, that just has a certain viewpoint where they don't expect they don't accept other certain viewpoints and they want to revolt. They want to complain to management. They want to uh, say, we're walking out if this person is allowed on the platform. You know, we saw this with Spotify and Joe Rogan. There is, of course, that mentality of, I don't like that particular viewpoint. I'm only going to allow viewpoints that I disagree with that are in a certain realm. And anybody outside of that, they should just be silenced. They're misinformation. They're conspiracy theorists. We all know those exist. Those types of mentalities exist. And yeah, maybe some of those mentalities even exist at the Hill. But, you know, and people and I and I, I hey, it, I think anybody should be allowed to express their opinion. And if they feel that way, they should express it. If they want to talk to management about it, absolutely fine. You know, like right. I'm not here to censor anybody. Um, but what what a company then ultimately ends up doing in the Hill is about having multiple viewpoints, having right. different perspectives, as long as they are based in fact and fact checked. And everything I talk about is fact checked and based in fact, you might not like my conclusion or my opinions. That's how you know, that's the premise of this show. Well, I'm not going to comment on a specific transaction. Uh, what I can tell you as a general matter, no matter who owns or runs uh, Twitter, uh, the president has long been concerned about the power of large social media platforms, uh, what they ha the power they have over our everyday lives, has long argued that tech platforms must be held accountable for the harms they cause. Uh, he's been a strong supporter of fundamental re reforms to achieve that goal, including reforms to Section 230. And 
So that wasn't the only time Saki mentioned Section 230 either. Here she is responding to a question which I believe is from our dear friend Philip Wegman. And we would support taking, uh, including reforming Section 230, enacting antitrust reforms, requiring more transparency, and the president is encouraged by the bipartisan uh, support for or engagement in, in those efforts. So why the sudden interest in reforming Section 230 now that Elon Musk is set to take control of Twitter? Now, in fairness, the interest is actually not sudden. Biden has long held that Section 230 should be eliminated. He previously said, quote, Section 230 should be revoked immediately, should be revoked number one for Zuckerberg and for other platforms. So confusingly, Democrats have managed to bring many Republicans on board with this idea of changing or getting rid of Section 230. No less an authority than former President Donald Trump has railed against 230. At a Georgia rally a year ago, he said that we have to get rid of Section 230 or we won't have a country anymore. And in fact, Republicans who support getting rid of Section 230, well, they're getting played by Biden, Saki, etc. Because without Section 230, social media would become even more hostile to conservative speech. And many viewers are probably asking right now, OK, what even is Section 230? So <laughs> allow me to explain. Section 230 is a federal statute that protects internet platforms from some speech-related liability. For instance, if I say something defamatory in this video, I can be sued, just like anyone else. But YouTube cannot be sued because Section 230 treats me, rather than YouTube, as the speaker. So the reasons for having this law are, I think, fairly obvious. If YouTube, Twitter, or Facebook were legally responsible for all speech on the platform, well, then they would have to moderate way, way more aggressively. Maybe only people with blue check marks would get to post at will. Maybe you'd have to fill out an application and prove that you wouldn't post content that could get the platform in trouble, something like that. Section 230 creates the legal regime that permits the internet to exist as it does right now, without gatekeepers reviewing posts or videos before they appear on the platforms. Now, of course, I disagree with many of the individual content moderation decisions that the platforms make. People are not wrong to complain that the moderation has been too heavy handed. We have countless examples of that. But getting rid of Section 230 wouldn't fix that problem. In fact, it would make it much, much worse because there would have to be much more approving of what posts are appearing. Now, political figures like Biden and like Saki, I think they realize that, which is why they do want to see the law abolished. Without Section 230, companies like Facebook and Twitter, they'd have to carefully screen content. They'd purge problematic posts, which of course means purging more of the kind of posts that they already purged too aggressively, which is exactly what the Biden administration wants. They want more purging of, of content that they don't agree that relates to COVID and you know other things of that nature. There's no doubt they want it even more desperately now that Elon Musk is taking over Twitter and will possibly have a, have a different regime and allow more, more free speech kind of content. So there'd be no better way to throttle this new Twitter that Musk is creating than to subject it to endless frivolous lawsuits that are currently kept at bay by Section 230. As Steve Del Bianco of NetChoice, a tech trade association, put it, the biggest threat to Elon Musk's vision of a less moderate Twitter is Section 230 reform, which is why it's not, I'm not surprised at all to hear Jen Psaki mentioning it repeatedly the other day. Vice President Kamala Harris has tested positive for COVID-19, her office shared yesterday. The vice president plans to isolate until she tests negative. However, President Biden will not be quarantining. The beep is not considered a close contact. Did you get that? Not a close contact? It's hilarious. <laughs> the administration maintains that Vice President Harris is asymptomatic, leading some experts to question her use of the Paxlovid COVID-19 antiviral treatment pill. As reported by the New York Post, quote, Paxlovid is designed to reduce severe symptoms among high-risk patients, which has some experts questioning why it would be prescribed to a healthy, double-boosted, and asymptomatic 57-year-old patient. Just this week, the Biden administration expanded Americans' access to Paxlovid. In clinical trials, the drug has been shown to reduce the risk of COVID hospitalization by 90%. So I don't know. I, I mean, I guess you can say, well, she's she's not like other people. She's an important the person. Next in line to so lead the free world. And yeah, I get it. But on the same, by the same token, it, it is bad optics. Yeah. You know, and that's not the only part of this. Is this bad optics? Um, people were commenting on the fact that she said she was going to stay out until she tested negative longer than the CDC recommendation of five days to go back to work regardless. And so, again, it's this do what I say, not what I do. They just don't need her back in the you know? office until. <laughs> right? Well, did you see the, pic the picture they released of her hard at work, working from home that I think her husband posted? It's one of these kind of 
everyone does it. I don't mean to pick on her in particular, but these kind of charming stage shots where there's no computer to be seen. You know, like when you're watching a Tyler Perry movie and it's like, I'm at an office, but there's like no When I'm watching no a desk. Tyler Perry movie. <laughs> I've never watched a Tyler Perry movie before. I don't, know, I don't know your, your life, Rob. I'm not trying to put you in a box. But when you're kind of watching a cheaply made movie when they haven't given much, given much thought to like how to stage the person as the profession they're supposed to have. Oh, I'm an architect, so I'm wearing these glasses, oh, right? Sure. But they're just, there's. Sure. It, I've got a wrench, so I'm it's a, got a wrench. So I'm a plumber. Wrench repairment? No, you use the wrench for repairs. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, she's sitting at a desk with like a piece right. of paper and pen in front of her. And maybe look, Naturally. I don't know what it takes to be the vice president. Maybe there's a lot of paper writing documents. by hand. <laughs> what has to a lot of writing by hand. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you don't have a computer in front of you, you're not doing work. Is the reality of uh, of of you uh, know in a, a white collar working environment. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Uh, correct. So you know, it is what it is. You know, she takes her licks. But I think the real concern here is that you know I've had people in my life people in her age bracket and, and older who have recently, you know, gotten COVID and been, you know, told they have to return to the office by a different metric than someone like Kamala Harris and in ways that seem to be obviously against common sense science. You know, it's not about whether or not it tests negative. It's about whether, you know, five days out, you're supposed to go back. And that to me, like, I know that we're coming from this COVID skepticism from a different perspective. I think you would like there to be less restrictions and I, I don't want them to be more, but I do want them to be more finely uh, mm -hmm. attuned to what would actually prevent the spread of COVID if we believe that there are things you could do to prevent the spread of COVID. And moments of, again, political theater, COVID theater like this yeah. don't help. I think she could go ahead and take the rest of the year. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the bit of not being considered a close contact. I mean, it's, it's an easy gag, but also just consider what that means about how frequently she must not be meeting with the, with president. the president. Yeah. It's truly like, I, I am rewatching, I just finished rewatching it, uh, Veep, mm -hmm. which is where the Selena Meyer, the, mm -hmm. played by Julia Louis Dreyfus, is always, in the early seasons at least, before she becomes the president. Can I, I does the, did the president ask for me? Can mm -hmm. I meet with him? And, and the president's never shown because mm -hmm. he's not, they don't need to show him because she never gets an audience with him. Mm -hmm. And maybe into the, your point <sighs> about Veep, it's maybe not a Kamala Harris specific thing. And maybe no. it's not fair to say that this is, you know, she's particularly, like a, a particularly impotent VP. But it doesn't help with all of the leaks that have come out of her office over the course of the past year and all of the staff fleeing to have this as the cherry on top. It's a difficult job because it's not really a job. There's not a lot to do. You know, it's really just to smooth out the ticket. Mm -hmm. uh, but given that that is really the only exp uh, expectation, I would not say she's done particularly well. I, she, she doesn't seem to bring a lot. She's not, she's less popular than he is. Um, I don't think she's more popular than he is with any specific demographic. I nope. don't think there are people. Black people never supported Kamala right. Harris. Bernie right. out right. blanked her. She couldn't win her own state. All of these things down the line. There was this belief that she was going to bring black voters in. And you can still see uh, Joe Biden really trying to milk the Supreme Court pick, really emphasizing these symbolic elements. I heard uh, that he spoke with the CBC, Congressional Black Caucus about a month ago, and there's all this emphasis on Juneteenth and all of these issues that are ultimately very superficial when you look at the things that black voters are asking for, especially in the context of the summer of 2020. And I don't know that that's going to keep working. I think a lot of people are hip to the game at this point. Mm -hmm. And if we were picking black women who are going to bring a new constitu constituency to Joe Biden, you know, he could consider a leftist pick for this easy uh, desk job going forward. <laughs> Look, I can sit here and pretend to write on a piece of paper all day. <laughs> all day. <laughs> Even without COVID, you know? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Absolutely. Brianna, Brianna for VP. No, I don't want to lose another co-host, so no, bad idea. But, uh, but otherwise, yes. Uh, it, the, the whole, I don't know. It, I want Paxlovid to be available to more Americans, mm -hmm. obviously. You know, whatever administrative hang-ups are in the way, and I'm sure there were considerable ones. You know, we, the CDC could have moved, the FDA could have moved a thousand times faster, I'm sure. Uh, it, it's great that this really does seem to work in the in the cases where you get it early enough and you were going to have a severe outcome. But uh, so maybe we should probably get to a point where we just have enough of it and it's it's approved enough to, to I guess, to give to everyone over a certain mm -hmm. age, probably, if they're diagnosed. But I don't think that would have applied really in Kamala's case. Cause yeah. I mean, again, she is second in line. And I understand right. that there's there are some reasonable different standards here, uh, but it's not a good look.